Gospel according to Matthew, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to divorce her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had given birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning. Magician. That's what I'm hearing. So we got another traffic story, and you were sitting in traffic, and you were just kind of waving your wand, and then all of 
clear, right? Well, yeah, that's a bad moment. God showed up there. Also, God probably showed up for your parents' patience, right? Yeah? We're not people of road rage, right? I'll tell you a joke. A Philadelphia driver and a New York driver moved to New Jersey. <laughs> that's our house. <laughs> any other God moments? Any other places that you've seen God, whether big or small? Yeah. When God, uh, when God helped Ron fix the uh, pump in the basement and he didn't have to get a plumber. That was really Yes. <laughs> God showed up to help Ron so you didn't have to hire somebody. Absolutely. Joan? I went caroling with a few friends last night to some people who have not in good health. Peace be with you. There we go. So this Christmas story that we tell over and over and over again, we read it in the Bible, we read it in children's books, we read it in adult stories. How many of you are familiar with this version that we read today? How many of you think, when you think of the Christmas story, yes, the angel appears to Joseph? All right, I'm, I'm glad. I see a lot of head nods. These pieces from Matthew's Christmas story are often overlooked, though. If you look at the kids' stories, they don't always show Joseph. They don't always show the angel appearing to Joseph. And they definitely don't go through the genealogy like we heard a few weeks ago. Although I bet that would be a really good kid story to put them to sleep. <laughs> so this Advent season, we've been looking at the Christmas story. All the different pieces from just different Gospels. If you were here on Advent 1, we talked about the genealogy of Jesus. So-and-so, son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so, and it you know, went on for a very long time. Then last week, we heard about the angel appearing to Mary, the Annunciation. And continuing chronologically, now we get to the angel appearing to Joseph. We so often, when we tell the Christmas story, focus on Mary and Elizabeth, the narratives that are in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John. But this is the beauty of Scripture, is that no one Gospel tells the full story. We have to read each of them and find the different pieces to put the puzzle together. So this is it for Matthew's narrative of how Jesus was born. We've got the genealogy as the first half, and we have our gospel for today as the second half. That's it. Genealogy, angel appears to Joseph, baby is born. Quick and easy. Short and sweet. But Matthew's story is missing my favorite parts. Maybe some of your favorites, too. The angels, the shepherds, the Magnificat, which we'll get to next week. 
None of that happens in Matthew. Again, the beauty of bringing all of the different scriptures together to paint the full picture. But this piece of the Christmas story is an interesting tale. And when we don't put all the pieces together, we often miss out on this story. What I love about Joseph's story is that he had a choice to make too. Last week, we talked about the fact that Mary had a choice when the angel appeared to her and she said, yes. I will do this. Now it's Joseph's turn. The angel appears to Joseph and he has a choice to make and he too says, yes, I will do this. Now we know a lot and a little about Joseph. We know from our scripture today that he was a righteous man. And we know from his genealogy that he had a long lineage of faithful, prominent, biblical folk. He is a son of Abraham and Tamar and Bathsheba and Ruth and David. So many stories that you may be familiar with. But what matters the most about this story today is the fact that Joseph said yes. Joseph said yes to caring for Mary and for raising Jesus as his son, He said yes to challenging the status quo and the expectations. He said yes to choosing a better way to live a life of faith. We can argue about his actions. Were they honorable? Were they dishonorable? Was he right? Was he wrong to want to dismiss Mary? I read a lot of books and every single one this week had something different to say. But what matters is that Joseph said yes. From generation to generation, we tell this story of yes from Mary, yes from Joseph, the arrival of the baby Jesus. But how often do we stop and look at these individual pieces of the story? The genealogy portion of the Christmas story reminds us that there's room for every story. That God calls unconventional, ordinary people to do the extraordinary. Sometimes to have big God moments, like moving traffic, and sometimes little God moments, like putting a smile on someone's face. There is a place for all of that in God's story. Then, looking closer at the Annunciation, we are reminded that God meets us in our fear. That we are not alone and that God sits with us in the tension of the both and parts of our story. The joy and the sorrow, the happiness and the grief The times where we're like, yeah, God, you showed up. The times where we're like, seriously, God, you want me to do what? And today, this story of Joseph, it reminds us that we can choose a better way. That society and the world around us might say one thing, but God can help us to say another and to live a life in faith. This story of Joseph He is experiencing an interruption in his life. It's a bit of an inconvenience. He's in a debacle. What do I do? And it brings us to this moment of pause. What does he do when things deviate from the storyline that he thought his life would be? But I wonder how these interruptions might be moments of holy invitation. The interruption of Joseph's dream by the angel was an invitation to say yes to God. Joseph was invited to defy expectations, to choose a better way, to provide for his family, to gain a son, to literally help bring God into the world. I wonder what are the interruptions in our own lives? And how might they be holy invitations? I can tell you one very long, very big interruption in my life was when I moved to South Africa. Literally everything was interrupted, but it was a holy invitation. I had this image that I was going to go to South Africa, I was going to do great things, I was going to change people's lives, who knows? It's going to make a difference. That's not what happened. (laughs) In fact, 
My expectation was interrupted. My literal daily life and functioning was interrupted. I didn't have a smartphone. I had a Nokia brick I could throw across the street and it still worked. I had limited internet access. No unlimited text messaging. I had to walk down the street and buy those little cards and rip off the minutes and type in the code to get 100 text messages. Do you even know what that's like, Kayla? <laughs> oh yeah. It's awful. It's awful. <laughs> If you get one number wrong, you gotta type a whole thing in again. Let me tell you, 100 text messages did not go far. <laughs> I also didn't have a car. Couldn't just hop in the car and go down to the grocery store and buy my favorite piece of chocolate. Nope, I, all of that was interrupted. But it was a holy invitation to sit, to be, to learn and to grow. I walked to church every Sunday let me tell you, I got to know the drunk guys at the bar right next to the church, and they would always greet me, and I would greet them and keep going on my way. I had to take local transportation, which also meant I needed to learn all the signals of how to flag down the driver and get where I was going and befriend some people in the community who were very excited to have a white girl sit next to them. I had to learn a new language, new traditions, new customs, new ways to worship. And let me tell you, this season of Advent was very difficult and very different because it was definitely not snowing. It was like 90 degrees outside. But in this holy invitation, I realized I wasn't there to do anything besides learn. I was there to be, be fully present, open to trying and learning. I shared some of our Advent traditions with my family printed off coloring pages and showed them our advent wreath. I left a Christmas pickle there. But it was an opportunity to step aside from the life that we live here and to be in that holy invitation of something new. This advent season is an interruption turned into a holy invitation. Society says, it's Christmas time, Santa's coming. And our church reminds us that it's not, it's Advent. We're not decked out for Christmas yet, we're decked out in the blue and purple of Advent. Our daily lives are interrupted. Instead of going to work and working our nine to five, we're also processing and thinking about all the shopping, the baking, the cooking, the cleaning, the decorating, all the things that need to get done. But how is God's invitation to sit, to be, to learn, to grow, also here in these interruptions? Clearly you've all seen it because you're here and you're not shopping. Maybe during this time you're invited to sit with this invitation, whether it's here in worship, using our Advent devotional, telling the Christmas story in different styles and versions and picture books and reading the Gospels. From generation to generation, we've handed down this Christmas story, allowing the holy invitations to interrupt our lives. And in turn, we've turned them into traditions, growing and learning and teaching each other. It's not always easy, and Joseph is a perfect image for this. For him, we hear the invitation to ask the question, do I do what society says or what is right? We can cut him some slack. He had every right to not marry Mary. But what was right was to take her as his wife, to raise the baby Jesus. He lived countercultural to society, and it's an invitation that we are invited to participate in every day. How many of you have your Christmas tree at home? How many of you have got presents to wrap? The world says it's Christmas. We're living into that at home, but not quite yet here at church. Where are these interruptions showing up as holy invitations. Opportunities to gather and sing like you had the other day. We'll have another opportunity this afternoon. 
the opportunity to visit loved ones in person, online. It's a time where we remember those who have died and left traditions behind. From generation to generation, our ancestors had the same choice as Joseph. Do I do what is easy or what is right and just? And sometimes they chose the better way and sometimes they did not. But we are invited to name these choices, to pass them along or to learn and to grow from them. Because the blessing and joy this season, as our confession and forgiveness says, is to know that no matter how many times we choose wrong or lose our way, God continues to be a God of second chances, of community, and of love. From generation to generation, God says there is room for your story, no matter how broken or imperfect. And we become part of God's story by weaving our own stories as seeds of hope for those with us now and for those yet to come. From generation to generation, God meets us in our fear. This phrase, be not afraid, shows up 365 times in scripture. That is a story for every day of God showing up and sitting in the tension of that both and, that we can be celebrating and also sad, that we can sit with happiness and grief, joy and sorrow, and that God knows all of it. From generation to generation, we can choose a better way. We can choose to do what is right and just instead of what is easy, knowing that God will be with us each step of the way, that we will mess up and get it wrong, but God will continue to love us and meet us at the table with grace and mercy and love, but that God will also meet us in moments every day of baking cookies and watching the snowfall. From generation to generation, followers of Jesus figured this out and told the story, and now it is our turn. So I invite you to go about your week thinking on these questions. How do we tell the story of Joseph? Where are we called to see interruptions as holy invitations? Where do you see God at work around you? Amen.